Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. Uh, as we do prepare to begin, we'd ask everyone here in-house if you'll be so kind to check that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare. And, of course, we will post today's program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. And our Internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments at any time simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion today is Walter Lohman, director of our Asian Studies Center. He also serves as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University where he leads a graduate seminar on American foreign policy interests in Southeast Asia. Prior to joining us at Heritage, he served as Senior Vice President and Executive Director of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. He had also service, served the Council previously as a Senior Country Director, representing American interests in Indonesia and Singapore. He has also served as a Senior Professional Republican Staff for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as well as an aide to Senator John McCain on trade, defense, and foreign policy issues. Please join me in welcoming Walter Lohman. Walter. Thank you, Dan. Hey, thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Um, it's a hearty group in Washington that cares about Cambodia, so I really appreciate you coming and um, turning up to talk about it. It's, um, it's a really important issue. Small country, but something that has consistently been at the center of foreign policy despite its size over the last many decades, in fact. Um, I particularly want to thank our guests who um, I've actually traveled some distance to be here, so far from uh, California and Sichuan from Texas. Um, you know, this, this idea first came to me talking to friends on the Hill. Uh, we did a report recently, uh, Olivia Ennis and, and I on Cambodia, and I was talking to friends on the Hill about what we might do different in Cambodia with its aid program and, um, and, our, and our policy approach. And um, Dr. Ear's book came up several times in those conversations. So uh, we're, um, we're here to talk about aid dependency in Cambodia and how foreign assistance undermines democracy um, and try to give uh, some of uh, Sofo's ideas a little bit more currency in Washington. But I will tell you, it already has a, a quite a bit of currency among people who, who matter and people who are writing policy in this town. So we're just trying to expand the circle for him. Um, I wanted to make just a few introductions, um, you know, and, and I'm reminded looking through Sofo's uh, biography, a lot of which is actually in the book. Some of the some of the personal stories are in the book, which make it uh, a pretty interesting past and, and moving in many ways. Um, but I'm always reminded of a speech I went to see at um, UVA when I was a grad student there back in 1988. Um, the uh, Reagan gave his farewell address. There was foreign policy farewell. He, in the introduction, he talked about Thomas Jefferson. He went through all the things that Thomas Jefferson had done, and then he said, there's always an overachiever in the crowd to spoil it for the rest of us. That's how I feel introducing uh, Sofal Ear, because you go through his biography before, um, before his current capacity. He was at the World Bank in the United Nations. He has a PhD from UC Berkeley, and he has three master's degrees three master's degrees, and he's obviously written a couple books, uh, the, the first of which we're talking about today is, is already quite influential, and I, I imagine he has many decades ahead of him in terms of his influence on, on public policy. Uh, si Chan Siv, Ambassador Si Chan Siv, is um, a longtime friend of Heritage Foundation, has a lot of friends here. Every time I mention his name, I have seven or eight people that come up to me and say, can I see him when he's here? You know, make sure you let me know if he's here. Are we going to have lunch with him? Um, he's been in Republican circles, particularly for, for a long time, and, um, and been a guest of Heritage uh, before as well. He also has, his, he, he's also an author, has a few books out. One, Golden Bones, um, we, uh, we hosted here about five years ago when the book came out. And so if you haven't read that one, talk about a moving personal story, um, that's really worth reading, and I promise you, he truly does have golden bones, and you'll, re you'll, you'll realize that after you read the book. Um, ambassador Sichan Siv was uh, ambassador to the UN uh, ECOSOC, the United Nations Economic and Social Council, 2001 to 2006, in the, in the last Bush administration, the Bush 43 administration. He also served in the H.W. Uh, Bush White House in uh, 1989 and 1993. Um, he's been in the state since... Uh, 1976, 
and that's what his book goes through is his his experience there and his arriving in America. Very moving thing. So if we're we're here to talk about Sofal's book, but if you ever have a chance to read Sichan's, you should do it. Uh, and we're going to hear from Brett Schaefer. Sichan's going to give us sort of a a take on this topic from a Cambodian perspective, and then Brett's going to make some general applications to our USAID programs, because I think that's this is, in fact, a case study. Um, it's not just about Cambodia. It's about how this may relate to other other issues. Brett is um, our Jay Kingham Senior Fellow in uh, International Regulatory Policy. Uh, that's a long way of saying Brett is basically our expert on the UN system and, and also on, uh, on AID issues. Um, He's the editor of a 2009 book that got quite a bit of play called Conundrum, The Limits of United Nations and the Search uh, for Alternatives. He's been with Heritage since 1995 with a brief interruption at the Pentagon right, for, for a year. Um, he has a master's degree in international development from American University in Washington and a BA in anthropology from Florida State University. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to uh, Dr. Ear. He'll get us started, and then we'll... we'll um, click through with some commentary. Thank you. Right. Thank you for that, uh, Walter. Um, if I, I, actually, I have some advice. Because I have a lot of slides, you might want to sit uh, in one of those seats so that you can actually observe my slides as opposed to straining your necks as you turn. Um, so thank you all for, for joining me today uh, for this talk about my book, Aid Dependence in Cambodia, How Foreign Assistance Undermines Democracy. And um, of course, first off, thank you to um, the uh, Heritage Foundation, to Walter. I hope, I hope you, you're all right with my using your, your picture here, Ambassador Siv, uh, for joining me. I mean, you know, I remember in ninth grade uh, reading a, a story about uh, Ambassador Siv at the time, uh, personal assistant to uh, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, President Bush. And, uh, and making a poem out of that story because it was such an inspiring uh, story of um, you know, coming to the United States from taxi driver to talking his way to Columbia University to becoming a personal assistant to the president. Uh, unbelievable. And to Brett Schaefer for, for uh, helping in this discussion as well. So um, I teach at this place here, uh, at the Naval Postgraduate School, and I teach students who have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan uh, from war, uh, courses on political economy and nation building. And these, these courses are trying to impart in them the, the ideas of how do, how do you rebuild a country after, after conflict. And oftentimes, being military, they want to know, you know, how do you do it? Just give us a list of things that need to be done, and poof, you've got a country. But uh, oftentimes, the struggle is to explain how much more complicated it is than that. And it's not as straightforward as doing blueprints of a house, let's say, and building each room and creating the foundation, and suddenly you've got, you've got the house. Uh, a country is much more complicated than that. Uh, even if you can, uh, by death by PowerPoint, uh, create a slide in which you explain the counterinsurgency dynamics of Afghanistan stability and why the central government of, Af of Afghanistan doesn't have the support that it needs. Uh, you might not be able to get to the answer, or you still w won't be able to achieve the goal that you want. That the work that we do, in fact, is a lot more like gardening as metaphor. So it's it's you know the gardener has to anticipate the weather, uh, know the soil conditions, know what grows in that region, know when to prune, and it's really about this illusion of control that I want to dispel from them. Uh, gardeners have no illusion of control. Uh, we create the right growing conditions, nurture a healthy soil life, set up our lifestyle so we have time to tend our crops, and we plant a um, diverse variety of sturdy, healthy plants and watch them grow. We adjust as we go along, uh, removing excess weeds, mulching, watering, fertilizing when necessary, and picking off pests. But ultimately, the end result almost always includes crop failures. And that's really about expecting that things will go wrong, really, and unexpected successes. And we feel more like stewards, sometimes even observers, than masters of our domain. Of course, I sound like uh, the world's greatest gardener at this point, but uh, I actually do this to my plants. So uh, caveat emptor. Um, as, as, as Walter mentioned, I do have uh, two books, so I'd be remiss in not plugging the other one, The Hungry Dragon, um, which is really about China's uh, uh, resource quest around the world in Africa, in Latin America, and, and in Asia, and how that resource quest coincides with its strategic uh, influence in these countries, for example, Cambodia, where it managed to essentially 
um, t uh, get Cambodia to say whatever it wanted uh, at the, uh, uh, when it hosted ASEAN as chair of ASEAN uh, in 2012, for example. This is, this is a, 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 an incredibly influential way of, of controlling uh, the policy dialogue, and that, of course, influenced uh, South China policy. So why am I interested in Cambodia? Well, as, as uh, those of you who know a bit about my bio will realize I'm from Cambodia. Uh, of course, Walter mentioned Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, who said socialism only works in two places, heaven where they don't need it and hell where they already have it. Um, if you uh, get a copy of my book, the introduction begins with the following words. When I came to America in 1986, at age 10, starting seventh grade at Willard Junior High School in Berkeley, California, and not speaking a word of English, one of the first things I did was to write a letter to President Ronald Reagan to thank him for fighting communism. And I did this in the class of Miss Morrison, uh, my English as a second language teacher. Of course, I couldn't tell her because we were in Berkeley, after all. And the People's Republic of Berkeley wouldn't have appreciated my anti-communism. Um, but, uh, but it is really you know, a testament to where I come from. I'm, uh, you know, having lost my uh, father, a brother, uh, being refugees, having to escape the Khmer Rouge, it's something that I think lasts and, and, and is part of my narrative. Um, I was honored a few years ago in 2009 to speak about my story uh, at TED. I don't know. I'm sure a lot of you now know very well TED, the TED conference. And it was really the story of how my mother, uh, through her cunning and determination, was able to get five kids, uh, including myself, out of Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge period. Um, I'm swelling it for those of you who haven't seen the TED Talk, but she, at the end, is in the audience, gets a standing ovation. Uh, my wife, eight months pregnant at the time, is also in the audience, uh, and along with some very important people, according to the uh, TED folks. Uh, so really an opportunity there to, 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 to thank her, first of all. Uh, I didn't realize, or I, I thought at the time, I might not have the chance to travel again, long distances with her. Little did I know how right I was, because seven, years, uh, seven months later, she passed away. And it gave me the chance to think about some of the legacy and lessons from her life. So as I mentioned, um, I'm from Cambodia. Here, my parents in 1969. Uh, the house we live in today is occupied by 10 families. Uh, it was a nice villa, three-story villa. And uh, thankfully, it's not occupied by a tycoon or a general. It could, it could have been. Uh, but uh, I had the chance to actually visit it a few years ago. Um, Cambodia at the time was known as the Pearl of Asia, an island of peace. And even Lee Kuan Yew came to Cambodia, the founder of Singapore, in April 65 to learn from Prince Norodom Sihanouk about nation building. Uh, Phnom Penh itself, an architectural Marvel, uh, movies at the theater playing Prince Sihanouk's movies, The Little Prince, starring Prince Sihanouk. Um, and on April 17, 1975, as many of you know, Phnom Penh fell to the Khmer Rouge. And uh, they had fought a long war already, were uh, slightly peeved, uh, if not very peeved. And the violence soon began with uh, the evacuation of Phnom Penh. Uh, two million people in three days, including my own family in an exodus that uh, would take us to the countryside, many of whom would end up in uh, these labor camps. Uh, my family ended up working rice fields. The leader of the Khmer Rouge, Pol Pot, uh, passed away without so much as a trial. Here he is on the uh, left there, leftmost. Yes, leftmost. Um, the only way I can describe Cambodia uh, in a succinct way during that time is through the words of Michael Paternity, who wrote, once upon a time there was a regime so evil that it created an anti-society uh, where torture was currency, uh, music, books, and love were abolished. The regime ruled for four years and murdered nearly two million of its citizens, a quarter of the population. Now, it's very hard to think about a quarter of the population, two million people. It's, as I think uh, Tip O'Neill said, a million here, a million there, and soon enough you're talking about real money. Well. So now if you're talking about real people, uh, one out of four. And in a place called Tool Slang, if you've been to Phnom Penh, uh, it's a torture center that used to be a school. Up to 16,000 people were tortured to death there. Um, behind barbed wires in classrooms turned into uh, torture chambers on beds and using medieval torture devices. Mothers with their infants, you see the arm reaching up there. Um, 
babies, uh, considered enemies of the state, um, boys and girls, all considered to have been possibly KGB and CIA simultaneously, uh, which is pretty incredible, and uh, ending up in killing fields. So that's where my book uh, takes off. And uh, at that point, Vietnam invades Cambodia in 1979 and occupies the country for the next 10 years. So until 1989. And uh, on October 23rd, 1991, the agreements on a comprehensive political settlement of the Cambodia conflict, also known as the Paris Peace Accords, is signed. And Sihanouk is there in the center stage at the signing. Uh, you've got uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen, pr uh, who's been in that position since 1985, uh, on the leftmost there. And then Kyu Sampan on the rightmost, uh, a former head of state of the Khmer Rouge, now standing trial at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. His, his, the verdict, actually, in his case, expected in a, uh, in a matter of uh, weeks, uh, possibly uh, months. Um, the UN comes into Cambodia uh, under its largest UN peacekeeping mission ever, the United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia. And um, leave it to the Cambodians, but when you go to Siem Reap, where the famed temples of Angkor Wat are, there's a, a cultural center called the Cambodian Cultural Center, and it has various you know, wax figures of, of different periods of Cambodian history. And this is the, the period depicted uh, for UNTAC. Uh, I'm going to ask if you can see what is being portrayed here. Any ideas? I love audience participation. What do you think is being shown here? Yes, all right. Not, no, this is not a, an important meeting happening. Uh, yes, well, uh, the brothels, the, um, the, the peacekeepers. Uh, Richard Holbrook wrote, was visiting, actually, Cambodia during this time and, and wrote to the uh, special representative of the Secretary General, the, the head of the UN mission, about his concerns. You know, great work during the day, but at night I'm concerned about the spread of HIV AIDS um, and the peacekeepers, and never got a response. He was, I think, miffed about that. Uh, Yasushi Akashi, the, the SRSG, uh, was asked at a peace conference, uh, at a uh, press conference, about you know this brotheling going on, and he said, "Boys will be boys," uh, which I think was 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 a difficult answer to hear, especially now in this day and age. I mean, even recently, Secretary General Ban Ki Moon, I think, it specifically said, "We cannot have this attitude of boys will be boys." Uh, so, so it's 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 fascinating how things have changed, but it's taken a long time. Um, another example I write about in, in my book is the, uh, the scene where at a, at a, at a checkpoint in an area controlled by, by the Khmer Rouge, a teenage Khmer Rouge soldier stands and there's a bamboo pole that stops uh, Akashi and his force commander, like his top military uh, general, from crossing. And they have full authority, allegedly, over Cambodia. They could have simply gone across and said, look, we, we need to go into this area. Instead, this bamboo pole stops them. They turn back and I think show their cards really as to how little willingness they have, little appetite they have to confronting the Khmer Rouge during this period. Not surprisingly, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the election that takes place in 93 leads to the world's first ever arrangement of having two prime ministers simultaneously in charge with equal powers. The first prime minister, Prince uh, Norodom Ranarit, the son of, 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 uh, of Prince Sihanouk, uh, now king, uh, then you know, King Sihanouk, and then uh, Hun Sen, second prime minister. Of course, you can imagine what happens when you have two tigers on one mountain. And by 97, uh, Hun Sen undertakes a coup that removes Ranarit, replaces him with someone more pliable, the foreign minister, uh, Ang Huat, uh, and, uh, and continues onward thinking he's, you know, pretty much changed the, 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 the terms of the game. Fast forward to 2000 and 2010, um, $10 billion dollars in foreign aid and a few years later, what you observe is essentially a pattern of aid dependence that, that's really disturbing. This is a period of time when Cambodia is getting about 10% GDP growth, uh, almost. Uh, certainly between 2000 and 2008, it was uh, ripping at, at uh, near double digits. Uh, the, the global recession uh, slowed that down. But what you see is in terms of foreign aid, for every dollar the Cambodian government spent, uh, 94.3 cents was received in net foreign aid. So uh, you, you, you spend a dollar, and lo and behold, you get another dollar from foreign aid. 
Uh, and and that's, that's really, that's, that's, that's a staggeringly large number, it seems, right? I mean, 94.3 cents. Turns out that it's not actually the highest. You've got countries in Africa where uh, here, uh, based on 2008 data, uh, Liberia, for example, sees 771%. Uh, so for every dollar spent by the government of Liberia, $7.71 was given in net foreign aid. Uh, other countries with 200%, with um, Rwanda, for example, of course with varying successes. I mean, I think Rwanda has been a, 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 an interesting case there. The uh, corollary to all this is that taxes are languishing as a result. Now, I'm not a tax and spend guy. I, I don't think uh, you know, uh, enabling government to uh, tax large, large uh, income shares is a smart thing. But you do need some taxes in order to run the infrastructure, police, security forces, and so on that a nation state needs. And those taxes, those domestic revenues languish. Uh, typically at or below foreign aid levels, right? So you're collecting very little and you're incentivized by foreign aid not to collect more in taxes. And the impact that has on democracy is simply one of, hey, if you're not paying money in, why should I listen to you? Uh, so goes the government's thinking, as in you the people, I'll listen to the donors or I'll ignore, I'll pretend I listen to the donors and and take their money, and then I won't actually do what you, the people, want. Uh, what that also enables when you collect low tax revenues and low domestic revenues, I argue, is, is a, uh, a culture of corruption that flourishes. So um, in the mid-2000s, estimates varied, but three to five hundred million per year in corruption, which incidentally was about the amount that foreign aid equaled at that time. It was, it was, uh, and more recently, a March 2014 estimate of 10% of GDP would put that with a $17 billion GDP at $1.7 billion in corruption uh, money. That's the International Labor Organization estimating that. What happened in terms of development at the same time? Well, you would think that the money coming in would result in better outcomes, right? So one of the uh, statistics that couldn't be finagled was maternal mortality. Uh, the number of mothers who die uh, giving birth out of 100,000 live births. That went from 440 in uh, 2000 to 471 in uh, 2004 and dropping to 460 in 2008. How, how can more money in foreign aid actually lead to more mothers dying as a result uh, when they deliver? What happens in terms of inequality? Well, it's a global trend certainly, but inequality increased in Cambodia and increased dramatically. So you've got a Gini coefficient now that is on par with the Philippines and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And it's because you have a very, you know, these tycoons who have a lot of resources and have taken these resources through corruption oftentimes, through deals, uh, giving them monopolies over different industries. And what happened to democracy and governance as a result? Uh, using World Bank data on um, various dimensions of governance, what you see here for Cambodia is basically, you don't need to worry too much about, about all the trends. There's, there's actually nothing going on other than one trend, which is the dotted red line, which is uh, political stability. So political stability improves from 96 to 2008. And uh, it improves, I argue, primarily because you've had the same prime minister in charge since 1985. And in this diagram, you don't need to know what the names are. The black box is the prime minister. The yellow boxes are various. Uh, uh, in-laws and relatives of his controlling different uh, ministries. So it's, it is a family affair when you're dealing with the way a government is run uh, in that country. Now I've talked a lot about the macro picture. I want to go down uh, a notch here to, the, to some case studies to kind of give you a flavor of, of how this uh, relationship with aid works. Uh, and I'll talk about three cases. Uh, the rule of law in Cambodia and how that can be damaged in the, an example in which uh, property rights are captured when donors come in and try to do the right thing but then end up actually enabling uh, land grabbing. Uh, the garment sector where it's actually a success story. The garment sector is a major engine of Cambodia's growth, but it's actually a success because of an interesting little aspect of it involving not donors but, but, um, but uh, sort of the Chinese, greater China influence there. And then finally end with the Khmer Rouge Tribunal and this idea of norm penetration. So uh, international lawyers will talk about how 
you know, Western standards of justice will, will be transmitted into Cambodia through this tribunal. Uh, but I argue, actually, it's, it's norm penetration gone wrong. Um, the, quite the opposite has happened. Uh, corruption of the tribunal has taken place. Uh, political interference has taken place. Uh, and it's been the opposite. So first, the case uh, uh, of rule of law and the capture of property rights. Now, there's, there's this lake in Phnom Penh called Bangkok Lake, um, which I have followed uh, from 2008 to 2012. Uh, 20 thousand people live around the lake. It's uh, got three to four thousand families. It's in the middle of Phnom Penh. I would enjoy uh, evening drinks uh, from there. Uh, from the air, it looks like a wonderful place where when it rains, water can go to, uh, controlling flooding. It was sold by the municipality of Phnom Penh and filled in uh, to build commercial real estate and uh, residential uh, real estate. So. So it uh, doesn't look so bad from this, from this vantage point here. You fill in a lake, it's a big deal. You know? You've got more land as a result. But of course, the process of filling in the lake means pumping mud from the river into the lake, and it floods all the housing around the lake. Um, so these homes end up basically going under the mud. Uh, the people living around the lake, as a result, have to move. And uh, what happened? Why is, does this have anything to do with donors and foreign aid in general? Well, the World Bank during this time was uh, heading a land titling project. Phnom Penh was its target area. Give land titles to the people living in the capital city. Uh, the World Bank was tricked into not giving land titles to the people living around the lake. Uh, they recognized their mistake. The people living around the lake protested, of course. Uh, and the government reaction was, of course, to use violence. So uh, you have a situation where you know, people are, are trying to protect their their property rights, but you know, their property rights have been given to other people, and uh, good intentions leading to, an, to a terrible outcome. And it's not happened only in Phnom Penh. Of course, it's happened elsewhere. So Hang Chen Ta, a girl uh, 14 years of age, killed by security forces uh, while trying to prevent her family's eviction elsewhere in the country. Let me talk a bit now about a, at least a positive story, the garment sector, and how that is, in fact, a success story. So garments in Cambodia, uh, started from nothing in 94 to becoming 35% of GDP uh, uh, today, uh, involving 620,000 jobs, direct jobs, as many indirect jobs, and helping overall 2 million people. How did this happen? Well, in 1999, the US and Cambodia agreed to link labor to trade. So better labor standards in Cambodia, in the garment sector, would lead to more exports of garments to the United States. Now, you're not going to believe Cambodia when Cambodia says, we've got better labor standards. We've improved our labor standards. You're going to believe somebody else, a third party. Uh, and Cambodia was the first country, and I think to this day still the, the only country that has accepted a third party coming in and actually stamping a kind of uh, you know, seal of approval uh, quarter to quarter on its performance. So this third party, and it, and it actually worked. And this third party was uh, it's called Better Factories Cambodia. It's a UN international labor organization program that looks at you know, 480 points on a checklist, including minimum wage compliance, uh, uh, as well as not using children in the factories and so on. And uh, as a result, it, it gives these reports. Now, it, uh, in recent years, it actually stopped naming actual factories, which is, which is a problem, because then you don't know where the problems are. But I think it's going to return to actually naming the factories. Challenges remain. Cambodia's value uh, added uh, uh, chain is, is really very limited. Um, it doesn't make the, the, the buttons, the, the, the textiles, or the threads. It imports all of that, assembles the product, cuts, makes, trims, and then ships out the, the garments. Uh, so it's a very limited uh, part of the value chain. In terms of uh, exports, you know, it's reached now $5 billion in exports, mostly to the U.S. and Europe. And one of the interesting aspects uh, that I uh, sort of hinted to was this, this involvement of Greater China. Now, it's not China, Beijing. It's, it's Greater China. This is the Garment Manufacturers Association of Cambodia. They've got a website that talks about um, how they were created. So in mid-96, most of the garment investors coming from such diverse backgrounds as China, Hong Kong, Macau, Malaysia, and Singapore, which I think for those of you who are Asianists will realize is not all that diverse, uh, decided to form an ad hoc unit to represent them instead of being singled out individually when dealing with officials from the uh, Ministry of Commerce, which was in charge by the uh, Royal Government of Cambodia to oversee 
the export of garments uh, in, and the issuance of certificates of origin, which lets them say, made in Cambodia. What this is getting at is basically, we got together, us manufacturers, because we're basically Chinese, ethnic Chinese, and we were able to you know, unionize against, against the government and, and their uh, corruption. So capture avoidance thanks to Greater China. And here's a, an actual example of how they did it. Uh, we negotiate with each government department. You take $10 for inspection instead of $35. We agree. We tell all our members the negotiated cost is $10. Now you multiply that. They just saved $25 there for one inspection. There are multiple inspections. There are multiple shipments. There are hundreds of factories. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars saved as a result. Uh, and the alternative to not doing that, of course, is possibly what happened in, in Dhaka, where you've got the, the worst case there of, of a collapse of a, of a garment factory uh, because of the lack, really, of, of, of compliance to regulatory standards. Uh, fire and safety, I think, is essential. Uh, even in Cambodia, there's actually not a very strong link with fire and safety with respect to better factories, which I think ought to be one lesson. So uh, you know some of the things that happen elsewhere, like you know, Bangladesh, 700 workers dying since 2006 in factory fires, can impact global brands like Walmart when they are not careful about uh, making sure that, that their, their names are, are not tarred and feathered as a result of all this. Let me end with the, the third case, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, and its um, sort of norm penetration gone wrong, how standards there went awry. This gentleman is the uh, <coughs> director of that center that I talked about, Tul Slang, uh, the torture center that killed 16,000 Cambodians. He confessed in 2009, his name is Doik, he confessed in 2009 as to his involvement. Uh, a couple of years later, was found guilty um, in the deaths of at least 12,273 people, uh, sentenced to, get this, 35 years, uh, reduced for 19 for time already served, uh, he actually thought that was too long. He appealed. The prosecution appealed. Thankfully, he lost. Uh, so he's now on life in prison terms. But for about a year, it wasn't clear. He was technically sentenced to you know, 35 years, reduced to 19. Um, and then you think about this guy here. I'm sure a lot of you know who this is, right? Yeah, he's probably faded from, from the memories of, 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 of those of you who watch uh, you know, finance. Madoff, sentenced to 150 years. Uh, killed no one, uh, caused $65 billion in fraud, uh, and is not appealing. Or, you know, the, the Cleveland kidnapper, uh, this uh, guy, Ariel Castro, sentenced to life plus a thousand years, uh, who said, I am not a monster. Uh, he committed suicide uh, shortly thereafter. Um, who is really the monster? You think about, you know, Bernie Madoff, Doik. You think about what Judge Danny Chin, who sentenced Bernie Madoff, said. He noted that 20 or 25 years would have effectively been a life sentence, but he reasoned that the symbolism of the longer term was important given the enormity of the crimes. And you have to think about, about that when you compare it to Ian Tirat, uh, the Minister of Social Affairs, who was in charge of the hospital where my father received some care before his death, horrible care, uh, full of mite-infested care. Uh, she was released uh, due to Alzheimer's uh, last year. Her husband, Ying Sari, who is the foreign minister for the Khmer Rouge, dead at 87 on March 14th, never sentenced, never found guilty technically, so he dies technically not guilty, right? So it's, it's, it's really heart-wrenching. And I have to think about the lessons of my late mother who saved 21 lives, uh, if you count the kids she saved and the grandkids uh, as a result of those children. Um, and, and what she believed in, you know, that what goes around comes around. So, you know, that the people who had caused so much uh, havoc and harm in our lives would end up meeting their own fates. Uh, she was Buddhist, uh, and she believed in karmic justice. So, you know, in the next life, those people would be reborn cockroaches, for example. Um, so, in a way, she was able to forgive. Uh, forgive the fact that she hadn't gotten justice in her life, but could perhaps be comforted by the fact that in the next life, these people would, would pay uh, with, with a horrible life. And I think for 14 million Cambodians, the lack of justice uh, for the Khmer Rouge, the lack of justice for land grabbing and other uh, uh, corruption that takes place around them uh, is mitigated only by the fact that they believe in karmic justice, that, that, uh, that, that at some point, the people who do all these things will end up paying the price. And, um, and that, and that's, that's perhaps a comforting thought. Um, 
let me end with one quote from, from my book. Uh, in the conclusion, I talk about Coney 2012. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that video. At the time, it had come out 20 days when I was writing this, seen uh, 85 million times. And uh, the, the writer Teju Cole uh, really had something very provocative to say about it. He writes, there's much more to doing good than uh, making a difference. There's the principle of first do no harm. There's the idea that those who are being helped ought to be consulted over the matters that concern them. And it's, it's really this idea that you know, sometimes you try to help people, and it's really helping till it hurts. And, and perhaps a Hippocratic oath to development undergirded by a commitment to genuine participation by asking the people what they want before actually doing it for them and thinking you know best uh, is, uh, is a useful, um, I think, uh, corrective. So I've already taken 29 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be happy to uh, hear uh, reactions from my panelists and, uh, and, and, and welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, let's, um, let's turn it over to Sicha and we'll start with some commentary. Then hopefully we will have a few questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Uh, I want to thank the Heritage, uh, Walter and Kathy, who put this thing together. Um, I am very proud to be here with uh, you, Sir Paul, and you are the pride of our community. And congratulations to all the good job you have done and you continue to do. Uh, if you still have that poem, I'd like to uh, get a copy. I'll try to look for it. it. It has been a number of years. And I promise not to put it on eBay. <laughs> um, Good presentation uh, overall, and uh, I think the historical part was quite interesting because to me, I lived through that period. I was in Cambodia for 27 years, uh, 22 years under King Sienu, um, five years uh, under Lon Nol, and then one year under the Khmer Rouge, and then I escaped. Uh, the point about Singapore is quite taken because uh, uh, Cambodia was the first country to recognize uh, uh, Singapore's independence. And Singapore never forgets that. Uh, uh, this is the fact, despite the fact that we also had good relation with Malaysia at the time. As our Nathan, uh, who was ambassador here in Washington, uh, some of us may remember, he became president of Singapore later on. And he told me that at one point, uh, Singapore was planning to set up a government in exile in Cambodia if uh, their independence uh, didn't work out. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew came. Uh, I was one of the children who waved the flag along the, along the uh, road from the airport welcoming all visitors. In fact, in the 60s, everybody wanted to come to Cambodia, and uh, not just to uh, visit Angkor, but to see this model of uh, a new country that uh, is doing so well. And Sienu has a lot of credit uh, for uh, putting Cambodia on the map. Moving fast forward, uh, the Vietnamese uh, invaded uh, Cambodia in 78, uh, Christmas Day in 1978. Uh, but they did not capture Phnom Penh until, until January 79. That was when they set up the, the first uh, uh, PRK, the People's Republic of Cambodia, on January 7, 1979. Um, I was uh, intrigued by you mentioning the Cambodian Cultural Center in Sinu. I've never been there. Oh, okay. I, I, should, I should go and look at it. And that, uh, that slide was very interesting because in UNTAC, as Sir Paul mentioned, uh, was the largest uh, peacekeeping operations in the history of the United Nations, uh, 22,000 people, some a few billion dollars. and the. Uh, the hope uh, and the plan was to stabilize the country and organize the election, but it didn't go. It didn't go fast enough or strong enough, like Sir Paul mentioned about confronting the Khmer Rouge. Um, the premiership, the co-premiership, was probably one of the one of the uh, major mistakes in modern government to have two uh, two prime ministers. But uh, Prince, you know, Prince you know, thought that it was important to keep uh, the uh, CPP in there, and the only way to do that was to have it. Uh, I mean, all, a lot of mistakes were made by the Phun Senpek people also, uh, Prince Sinanrut, 
and what many people call the Parian, Parisian crowd, because these are a lot of people who came uh, back to Cambodia from Paris and others. Uh, these, uh, they think that uh, uh, everything was put on the plate for them, so uh, they went into all kind of corruption and so on and so forth. It's very sad uh, to see these people who grew up, uh, studied uh, in modern, con uh, modern democracy like France, Australia, especially the United States, to go back and doing even worse than those uh, who are in Cambodia uh, in terms of corruption. Uh, the tax uh, taxation issue is, uh, is interesting because you mentioned that it was more on a revenue uh, aspect than uh, just taxing. And uh, I'm not, a, I'm not a for uh, tax, taxation either. But uh, the, uh, if the money is not well spent, uh, and that goes into the aid issue. And I was uh, already at, in New York when George W. Bush announced here in Washington in March uh, 2003, uh, the week before we went to Monterey for the International uh, uh, Development Financing Conference. In Monterey, he announced the creation of the Million Challenge account, which is sort of functioning function parallel to AID that we have had for a long time because the MCA or MCC was founded on the premises that money is given only to governments or countries that are committed to good governance, to investment in people with an economic uh, sound policy. And uh, I believe uh, if my memory serves me well, I think the first country was, uh, was Georgia and Madagascar, you go to, uh, to the MCC uh, website, you see that it's all over the world now. Uh, th that was a specific, specifically designed for, for countries that have good governance. Uh, and the international community seemed to have a lot of uh, compassion, uh, 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 exuberance in a way for Cambodia. Every year or every meeting that we have on uh, uh, the pledge Pledging conference, governments seem to be more eager to increase their money than call to question uh, the issues of human rights, of good governance, and so on and so forth. So the three points that uh, Sir Paul uh, were making about the rule of law, uh, th that is a very sad outcome when you see people chasing out of their uh, houses uh, without any compensation. and. Uh, the pictures that were shown here are really heart-wrenching. The garment uh, fact uh, sector uh, is quite promising, uh, but I am sad that uh, the other side of the economy has not been focused on, especially the agricultural sector, because Cambodia has been primarily an agricultural uh, based economy uh, from early on. Uh, I remember at one point in the 60s, we used to export rice to, uh, as far as to Senegal at the time. That reminds me of what you say about uh, Cambodia being considered as a pearl of Asia. Uh, one, one, one year I went to Cote d'Ivoire uh, uh, in a UN Security Council mission, and we met with the president at the time called uh, Laurent Gbagbo. Uh, there was a discussion, there was a meeting, there was a peace process, and he didn't want to leave. And uh, I represented the United States uh, on the delegation of the UN Security Council meeting. So we all took turn to uh, make our presentation. When it was my turn, I spoke in French. Uh, I told him that uh, I was born in Cambodia, uh, but I represented the United States on this delegation. And uh, the analogy was that in the 60s, Cambodia was the pearl of Asia, like you mentioned. And in Africa, it was Cote d'Ivoire. So Abidjan and Phnom Penh were the pearls of Africa and of Asia. And I told Laurent Babo, I said, Mr. President, unfortunately, Cambodia made a wrong turn. So what happened was uh, just a human tragedy of human proportion. Cambodia became a 
a land of uh, blood and tears. Uh, he was looking at me while I was speaking. He was, I think he was puzzled that here, somebody who looked like a Chinese, who spoke French, who said that he was from Cambodia, and who represented the United States. <laughs> at the end of the meeting, he walked over to me. He said that uh, I appreciate your presentation, and I saw the movie The Killing Fields, that I would do anything uh, to prevent uh, Cote d'Ivoire from uh, meeting that fate. But so that's the point about uh, the Pearl of Asia and the Pearl of Africa. The Khmer Rouge Tribunal is a joke. Uh, if you think about the symbol of injustice, uh, it will be the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. Uh, when uh, Duit was found guilty and was sentenced uh, to 19 years in in prison, uh, it was a major slap on the face of the victims and just slap on the wrist of the perpetrator. Uh, I don't know how much money has been spent on the tribunal right now. I think some figures said 150 or 160 million dollars. Uh, to spend that much money to bring five or six people to justice or injustice uh, were really, uh, were really a slap in the face of humanity. Uh, how much, how many schools can you build? How many uh, hospitals can you build? How many teachers, how many nurses can you train with that money? And then we spend some $150 million to just slap people in the face. So it, uh, it, it is a very sad outcome and uh, when, when, when somebody is responsible for 16,000 people's death, uh, the only sentence is a death sentence. I mean, you kill my friends, you kill my neighbors, uh, you kill two million of my people, you ought, to, you ought to be sentenced to death. But Cambodia's argument was that uh, Cambodia doesn't have a death sentence, which leads me to another thinking, Walter and Brett too, that if we were going to fund any tribunal, make sure that that country has the sentence. Because these crimes are, and we call crimes against humanity, but this is just beyond, beyond proportion. I, I, you mentioned about Tip O'Neill saying a million here, a million there. Soon enough will be real money. But uh, the people who are the survivors of this, the families of friends, including you, including me, and uh, everybody else. We want to move on with our lives. But if you could create a tribunal that uh, is more a symbol of injustice uh, than providing justice to people, you just bring a lot of agony, a lot of uh, sad memories to these people. So if there is a way we should do it, the United States should never get involved in tribunal, international tribunal, unless we are sure that there is a provision in the law of the country or whatever legal, legal system that we set up, that should be a death penalty. So with that, I thank you very great, much for great. the presentation. Thank you, uh, Sichen. Um, I'm also glad that Dr. Ear went through some of the history um, because I think um, uh, Americans have notoriously short memories, and uh, and for good reason. It's not unfair, and, and it's it's uh, it's good to be reminded of all that because you, you know you talk about um, you talk about the million here and million there, and, and the, the incredible atrocity that was the Khmer Rouge uh, tyranny. You know, a little off topic, but what's going on in North Korea? Mm -hmm. And no one even cares. I mean, I mean, we care more right now probably about Cambodia than people care what happened uh, a long time ago in Cambodia than anyone cares about what's going on in North Korea now. Yeah. But I want, I want to mention, you, you brought me to think about another point, that a few years ago I was in Cambodia, and some friends of mine told me that uh, the United States is quite popular here, uh, some 85, 86 uh, percent, because the Cambodians realize that we are there to build institutions, uh, not to make money, um, for not not for for quick money like other investors and so on and so forth. 
which, which is very interesting that the United States was more popular in Cambodia than in America. <laughs> yeah, that may be. Right? Uh, thanks. Um, on the last point uh, by Ambassador Su, um, of course, the International Criminal Court doesn't have a death penalty either. Um, and the Yugoslav and Rwandan tribunals have been going on for two decades now and mm -hmm. uh, at high cost as well. So these processes seem to take quite a bit of money, uh, quite a bit of time. Um, and you wonder how satisfying the end results are going to be on any of these. Um, when Walter approached me for doing this panel, I was a little bit puzzled. Um, I'm not a Cambodia expert, I'm not an Asia expert by any measure. Uh, I do have a background in international development, and so I told him that I, I would consider being on the panel, but I'd want to read the book first, and I'm really glad that I did, because uh, first of all, it's a great book. It's very interesting. It's well uh, researched. It's detailed. It's thorough. Um, it really touches on a lot of different research done by other experts in the field and really uh, provides a lot of great um, uh, discussion about uh, efforts to look into aid dependence and, and other research and background in Cambodia in particular, but I think it has a much wider reach than that. And so I, once I had uh, read the book, I went back to Walter and said, yes, I'd be happy to be on the panel because, um, Walter, I'm not sure if you mentioned this at the beginning, but I spent most of my um, career working on sub-Saharan Africa, uh, on development issues, on peace issues, on security issues, governance issues in sub-Saharan Africa. But over and over again, when I was reading the book, I found myself nodding over and over again, um, my head thinking about all the parallels between what's being described in the book in Cambodia and all, in, all the things and experiences that we, I've seen over and over again in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in respect to uh, the time, I'm not going to get into a great deal of uh, detail about this, but I do want to touch on several different areas. Um, the first is on the peacekeeping element of this. And um, Professor, you went through and talked about the bamboo uh, barrier and how that turned back the most powerful force in Cambodia, the um, uh, Yashuki Akashi, the head of the UN Transitional Authority in Cambodia, UNTAC, and he's turned back by a single soldier at this bamboo um, uh, uh, barricade. And what that said and what that communicated to the broader uh, population of Cambodia and more importantly to the Khmer Rouge who were uh, regarding it as sort of an empty suit at that point. Um, and unfortunately, that meekness is rather common in UN peacekeeping operations. Uh, everyone remembers how UN inaction in Srebrenica and Rwanda led to a, a horrible tragedy there. Um, well, in response to those humanitarian disasters, the UN changed its procedures. What it did is it said, we're going to require our UN peacekeeping operations in these conflict zones to have a mandate to protect civilians in, that are under threat from violence. And that's, oh great, problem solved, right? Now the UN peacekeepers are going to be ordered to protect civilians, so they're not going to be turned back by a bamboo pole. They're going to be forced to go in there and actually do something about that. Well, unfortunately, the reality is somewhat different than just passing a policy, right? Uh, this past March, the UN published a, uh, a, a, quote, evaluation on the implementation and results of the protection of civilian mandates in UN peacekeeping operations. Uh, not only does the UN specialize in peacekeeping, but it specializes in unwieldy topics and titles for their uh, papers and reports. But um, that evaluation looked at eight of the nine UN peacekeeping operations that currently have a mandate to protect civilians. And what they found is that of the 507 incidents involving civilians reported in the Secretary General's reports from 2010 to 2013, the peacekeeping missions failed to respond to 406 of those incidents. Uh, where civilians were attacked. In other words, they failed to respond 80% of the time. In the 20% of the time that they did respond, uh, the UN, uh, quote, almost never used force even as a last resort. So the peacekeepers have been instructed to protect civilians, but the reality and the study by the UN itself shows that 80% of the time they don't respond when civilians are attacked. And when they do respond, they almost never use force to respond to those attacks. Um, a three-part series um, done by Colin Lynch at Foreign Policy Magazine this past spring uh, demonstrates that the UN is not unaware of this problem. In fact, the UN is not confronting the problem and doing its best to conceal the problem. Uh, specifically, the former spokeswoman from the African Union United Nations hybrid operation Darfur, Aicha El Barisi, provided Lynch with uh, just reams of confidential documentation that showed that the UN uh, commanders on the ground 
knew about these incidents and they decided specifically not to respond to them, and then they coordinated with UN officials to conceal that fact from the UN Security Council, which oversees the UN peacekeeping operations. So this is a deliberate effort by the UN to not act when it should be acting, and furthermore, to conceal its inaction from those who possibly could compel it to act. That's troublesome, uh, to say the least. Uh, uh, Professor Ira also talks about political confusion. Um, they talk about uh, UNTAC failing to enforce the democratic outcome of the 1993 election and instead acquiescing to this power sharing arrangement with disastrous results. That also raises some interesting parallels in Africa. You see the UN operating in conflict zones in areas where governance is lacking. Uh, you take a look at South Sudan. South Sudan uh, has an elected president, Salvia Kiir. He is not the best person in the world by any means. Uh, his regime is corrupt. Um, he has authoritarian tendencies, but he was elected in an election that was free and fair. Uh, his former vice president, Rik Mishar, uh, wants to become president of South Sudan. Uh, because he was acting against the wishes of Salva Kiir, he was forced out of his position as vice president. Now, Mishar was unhappy about this, but instead of buying his time to the scheduled elections in 2015 to see if he could win that election, uh, he went to the bush and started a rebellion. That rebellion has resulted in thousands of people dying, mass chaos throughout the country, and a lot of suffering, a lot of suffering. But the UN response to this has been not to say, we recognize the duly elected government of South Sudan, we're going to hold you responsible for going to the bush and creating all this chaos. Their response instead was to force negotiations on South Akir and say, we're going to have a coalition government to address these concerns. Now, the purpose of this is understandable. They're trying to stop casualties, and they're trying to stop the chaos that's going in South Sudan. But you have to consider the signal that's being sent to other countries in the region. You also have to see, uh, consider the signal that's being sent to future uh, losers of elections in, in South Sudan. You're essentially saying if you lose an election, if you want to seize power, if you want to uh, facilitate the early end of a current government, create enough trouble and the UN is going to put pressure on the existing government to accommodate your desires. That is not a recipe for long-term stability, long-term democratic, democratic governance. In fact, I would say that it probably undermines democratic governance and increases the chance of conflict going forward. Um, and it also places, uh, currently, the government at odds with UNMIS, which is the UN peacekeeping operation, which has created enormous problems of its own. So. Uh, Professor Ear notes that also the, uh, how the international aid in the UN and other institutions have create, become surrogates for states, for governments. They provided the services that governments otherwise might be um, expected to provide on their own. And I mean, he notes that the, the peacekeeping operation in, <laughs> in Cambodia was $1.5 billion, uh, you know, 20,000 um, soldiers. You have that in Democratic Republic of Congo today. Between the, the missions in Sudan, you have even more than that. Uh, at, dedicated to that. These are wholesale military operations that have taken essentially the sides of various governments and, and places there and assumed the responsibilities of government to stabilize and secure the territory. Um, but what are you doing in that? You're also enabling them to escape the consequences of their own failures of governance. In Congo, for instance, you have uh, Kabila. His, his regime is corrupt. Uh, he stole the last election uh, by everybody's generally objective measure. Uh, he's failed to provide the services to his country. The entire eastern part of the country is, is chaotic. It relies on the UN to provide uh, security. Uh, there's no infrastructure to say uh, of any worth uh, in most of the eastern part of the country. Uh, yet, he, entire, he depends entirely on the UN to provide these services for them. Um, despite vast natural resources, the Congo is, um, the DRC is, uh, remains extremely poor. Annual per capita income below $300 um, dollars per capita. It ranks among the country's worst in terms of all the measures of infant mortality, maternal uh, mortality that you were pointing to in terms of Cambodia. Uh, corruption's rampant. Uh, and yet, the consistent support of the international community basically rewards him despite his failures of governance the expectations are removed from him because the international community has assumed these responsibilities for him. So I, I just wind up by, by noting that, uh, I mean, the similarities just run over and over and over again. You see um, 
uh, the fact that African governments hinder development through corruption, through patronage arrangements um, routinely. You, know, you mentioned family arrangements. How many African co governments uh, can point to the president or the prime minister and then his associated and extended family throughout positions in, in higher levels of government? Uh, tax collection is almost uh, non-existent in many countries. It's generally irregular, even in the best of cases. Uh, and at every level of government, uh, a little bit of it is uh, peeled off for personal benefit, so it never quite reaches the intent. Uh, it's, you look at, uh, I mean, the chart you had uh, laid it out very well. It's, uh, the amount of foreign aid coming in there vastly outstrips the resources that the governments raise themselves, and that diminishes the accountability of government to the people who pay taxes. Um, and it also, I think importantly, removes the, the need for the government themselves to assign prioritization among its, its funding priorities. If the government doesn't have to uh, have finite resources to allocate amongst different priorities, maybe it's not going to choose to do this uh, expenditure instead of another one. But the foreign aid comes in and says, we'll take care of health care, we'll take care of education, we'll take care of these other issues. Then the government's able to do it on these tertiary or secondary priorities that would not be supported by the international community, or perhaps by the taxpayers themselves. So um, just to, uh, as a final thought, I think that this book has enormous um, applicability beyond Cambodia. I think that the, the detail provided in here, e even though it focuses on Cambodia, has uh, utility in a number of different places. And, it, and the cases laid out here and the problems laid out in the book uh, are widespread and common. And I hope that the UN, uh, USAID, um, the World Bank and other institutions that, that populate and perpetuate these situations understand that good intentions are not good enough, that you actually have to take a, a broader look, a longer look at the situation. And the ultimate answer of this is to actually have uh, a government that is accountable, that is uh, accountable to the people. And, and without that kind of causal link, you're never going to have the, the feedback mechanisms necessary to make sure that uh, the needs of the citizens are going to be responded to. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Brett. Um, I think that was a, that was an extremely useful uh, perspective to sort of draw back a little bit and look at the broader issues and broader dynamics in, at play, because I think ultimately if these problems in Cambodia are correctable, the policy problems, they are big problems. They're not just uh, sort of unique to Cambodia. It's a dynamic that's at work, and you can see it in Africa and aid programs uh, more generally. I think uh, one of the big um, parts of the dynamic in Cambodia, and I think it applies across many issues, you, can, you know, look at Afghanistan and Iraq uh, most recently, and then the, the examples in Africa too, is that by 1993, the international community was exhausted with Cambodia. They didn't want to talk about it anymore. They wanted to find an excuse to turn power over, and if that meant Hun Sen preserved his power, then so be it. You know, that, that, that was their, their rationale, I think, in the end. Um, I wanted to uh, start with questions. I got one question from, the, um, from our online viewers, a gentleman named Steve Hirsch, a uh, freelance journalist. He asks, um, Dr. Ear, can you tell me how your speech implicates foreign aid specifically? This is the brothels. The pictures are dramatic, but brothels appear whenever a large number of relatively wealthy men arrive in a poor country or region, including when large numbers of investors arrive. Can you tell us how the other problems you mentioned, such as increases in maternal mortality, are specifically linked to foreign aid? Right. Um, so I'll be happy to do that, uh, Steve Hirsch, is it? Um, yes. the, um, so, all right, so, so the link is essentially the argument that I make is that Foreign aid comes in and disrupts uh, the incentives of countries to uh, collect their own revenues and develop themselves. So, so instead of using the money that they would normally uh, collect, uh, they instead can engage in corruption. Um, the link, if you look at different dimensions of governance, for example, rule of law, so the argument there is, is that um, uh, aid tries to you know, bring in rule of law, for example. Let's say you know, the focus on rule of law is build uh, courtrooms, judges, you know, train judges, train lawyers. Well, it's, it's well-intentioned, except that you're operating in a country where there's corruption, and so those judges are not going to, with their training alone, suddenly become uncorrupt. Uh, they, they, they operate within a system 
And so uh, there's political interference. There's a re when, when there isn't political interference, it, it boils down to who has the most money to bribe them to choose the side that wins. Um, and so aid, is it, there are sins of omission and there are sins of commission. So the sins of commission would, would likely be you know, where you come in and you've, you've messed up completely something that was functioning before or something that wasn't as bad as it was. And then there are sins of, yeah, you forgot to give or you were somehow told not to give land titles to these people, even though your whole project was about land titles. So now you've disenfranchised an entire uh, segment of the population. Uh, the, the theme of, of, of how this impacts uh, uh, democracy is really one of, you know, democracy requires accountability and accountability comes through this link between taxes and, and governments essentially saying, well, you, you pay taxes, we're going to give you services, and now we don't really need your, your tax money anymore because we've got foreign aid. And oh, by the way, we can uh, engage in corruption, which isn't, uh, which isn't taxes. I mean, it's, it's unofficial taxes, if you want to call it that. And so as a result, you end up diverging from what people want in, in their country and following other other goals. Well, isn't also the point with the uh, with the reference to the brothels that these UN peacekeepers are international public servants? They're not people in the country looking out for their own profit or something. And so, yes, those businessmen should all be subject to uh, the courts of Cambodia, you know, uh, for their activity. But but these guys are also responsible. That is, the UN peacekeepers are also responsible to the people who sent them there. And the problem is that they're there contributing to problems, not just, you know, keeping the peace and doing the things that they're, they're supposed to be doing. Um, let me open it up to the audience for questions. Anyone? Um, what, uh, yeah. uh, if I could add a word about this uh, issue, uh, perhaps the United Nations should, maybe they have it already. Uh, if they don't, they should have a kind of uh, training <coughs> uh, where peacekeepers should be uh, given before they are deployed, uh, or could they are deployed from different countries, but they, there should be some uh, uh, training about the cultural background <coughs> of the country they are assigned to, and especially trying to avoid uh, getting involved in, 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 in prostitution. So we have uh, had a lot of cases you know, in the Congo and so on where the peacekeepers themselves were, who were supposed to be there to protect became involved in uh, abuses, and that's a very sad uh, outcome. Uh, that's something that we should look at, and then you're going to write something about <laughs> that in the future. Maybe you should recommend. They, they do. They, I, I don't know if they have training specifically in the cultural uh, aspects of individual countries where they deploy, but they do have uh, briefings prior to mm -hmm. um, deployment where they're, sp they're told you should not um, uh, go to brothels. You should not, uh, you know, should not pay for prostitutes. You should not take advantage of the population that you're supposed to be uh, protecting. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, it, it still goes on a lot. Um, but the reason why it still goes on is because uh, either the the troops, the commanders, the countries contributing the troops don't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Uh, but more importantly, the UN itself doesn't take it seriously. They have, you know, they report the incidents. They say, well, the number of incidents is X, uh, and the number of incidents has been declining. We have no idea whether the incidents are declining because the UN doesn't want to report the incidents or because uh, it's actually uh, better discipline on the parts of the troops. But what we do know is that those who are actually found to be committing crimes, um, when they are uh, disciplined and sent home, there's no follow-up by the UN meaning that if somebody commits a crime as a peacekeeper and they're sent home or their unit is sent home, the UN stops at that point. The, they don't determine what discipline was done domestically. They don't know what uh, investigations were done to, uh, to find out if the crimes were done and who the particular perpetrators were. They don't follow up to find out who was, who was tried, who was convicted, who was jailed, how long it was done. The UN's interest stops at the moment when they deploy back home. And so there's very little incentive for the troop contributing countries um, uh, to, to really follow through. Well, um, I do know Steve Hirsch, so I'm going to just recommend to him that he um, go out and buy the book. Uh, you can do <laughs> Seriously, I mean, you can do it right from your, your Kindle and have it within the next 30 seconds. Um, be worth it because you can, you can see the whole case in some, in some detail that Dr. Ear makes. Um, we, we do just have time for one or two questions, so I, I want to those in. Right over here. Sorry, we have a microphone for you. 
Hi. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your comments. Uh, Dr. Ear, I was wondering um, if you could talk about the most recent national elections. Um, I think that's the closest we've seen to, you know, or we've come to seeing the CPP dislodged. Um, and I wonder, there's, there's been a lot of money going into Cambodia that originated with USAID, other um, aid agencies, and a lot of that's gone to bolstering independent media or building the capacity of civil society. And I wonder if you see any uh, good that might have come out of that, any correlation there. Could, could you quickly identify yourself? Oh, sure. I'm Craig Blackburn. I work at Freedom House. Uh, well, yes, uh, this last election in July 2013 was really a, a big surprise for a lot of people. Um, uh, even though the outcome is still in dispute, uh, the, uh, the, the ruling party got uh, fewer votes than it expected. Uh, it still won, according to its count. Um, and uh, so, so th you know, it, the surprise, it took everyone by surprise. Now, social media played a huge role in that. Um, one of the one of the concerns, uh, you know, for free and fair elections are you know, free media, uh, independent media, and of course Cambodia has one radio station that's independent. The others are kind of, you know, uh, 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 not independent television stations, all controlled by uh, the ruling party. How did this happen? Well, w what happened essentially was suddenly the internet allowed young people to re to to figure out what was really going on instead of instead of believing that actually just watch your karaoke. And songs and, and sing along. Uh, if you go on Facebook, on Twitter, you'll find that the opposition leader has returned and 200,000 people are out in the streets uh, you know, talking about it and welcoming him. So uh, and no news media uh, coverage in the, in the, uh, on television uh, during that time. So you know, the, it's just the, the jarring contrast made it Im impossible to reconcile and I think young people made a huge difference in the, in the vote turnout. In terms of uh, foreign aid, yeah, the U.S. has been actually one of the really leading supporters of, of um, civil society in Cambodia, and I think that that kind of support, of course, is 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 the kind that the the authorities in Cambodia don't like because it's it's this, the kind of support that countervails their influence, right? So so instead of instead of um, uh, uh, supporting what whatever it is the government wants to do. Uh, these these CSOs, uh, civil society groups, <coughs> and so on, um, start investigating or, or criticize and so on, and and, and that's that's a powerful um, uh, countervailing point. Um, other donors aren't nearly as interested as the U.S. Unfortunately, on that, uh, and and of course it, it takes far, you know far more resources than, than than are available from from the U.S. standpoint. So sometimes when we talk about cutting foreign aid to Cambodia. Prime Minister Hun Sen will say, you know, enough talk already, cut it off already, because he's actually saying, cut off the aid to those groups that are an impediment to my rule, uh, which I, I think some, we have to realize is, is really a, a dangerous situation where, of course, he wants that. He, he'd like nothing more than his opponents to be, to be out of money. Great. Let me take, this is the last question. Yeah, on this point, my name is John Sipson. I'm a human. Uh, my name is John Sifton. I'm with Human Rights Watch Asia Division. And on that point in particular, I, I think it's useful to talk about exactly what kind of money you're talking about here. Because when you look at the budgetary support, it really doesn't come from USAID. It doesn't come from the United States government. The most of the money that Cambodia is getting is coming from other countries, from the EU, especially from Japan, and from Vietnam in terms right. of security assistance. Uh, so on that point, um, there's been a lot of talk about the UN, and nobody gets more disappointed with the UN than Human Rights Watch, except perhaps you guys. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but there was a lot of UN bashing, but isn't it true that we should really be talking about the, the Paris signatories writ large, the United States, Australia, the EU members? Weren't they truly the... The, the perpetrators of the mistakes in the democratic rule in, in 1993, 1997, 98, 2003, all these elections that were stolen, weren't they falling down on their jobs? I mean, mm -hmm. shouldn't we talk about the, the state failures as much as the UN failures? And, and I would say that, yes. I mean, I think a lot of uh, folks in the opposition point to uh, the fact that the Paris Accords were, were not signed just by the folks that I showed in that picture. Um, uh, at the time, Prince Sihanouk, Hun Sen, Kyu Sampan, and so on. But, but, 
but countries, great powers that, that, that said, we will support this process and ended up being, well, you know, compassion fatigue or whatnot, uh, but uh, a, a real politics setting in that, that uh, Hun Sen is in charge and therefore he's not gonna be dislodged and we should just accommodate power. Uh, that's a real challenge. I think uh, uh, the, the narrative has, has, has to shift from the standpoint of, well, let's reform the Cambodian People's Party from within. Let's hope that they find out that you know, they need to implement changes on their own or with our help or whatnot uh, to, well, you know, actually people in Cambodia think that they should not necessarily just toe the party line. And, and whatever happened in the 1970s, uh, the fact that Cambodia was saved by, by the Vietnamese invasion, and they should always be grateful to that, isn't necessarily going to stick with younger people who didn't live through that period and find that their circumstances nowadays are not satisfactory uh, compared to what they see out there in other countries. Uh, so yes, the signatories need to take responsibility. Of, co of course, nowadays, you know, there's been a lot of change in the in in the power structure and in, in the in how the world operates, and so uh, there's retrenchment in resources, uh, sequestration, and of course, China, which doesn't care about human rights in Cambodia or governance in Cambodia, is giving a lot of money to Cambodia, enabling that country to do things that perhaps are problematic for for uh, for, for uh, human rights there. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Ear. Um, I really hate to wrap this up. I, we could talk about mm -hmm. this several different angles uh, on it for for another, you know, easily another thirty minutes. But I mean, but several hours if if we had the time. Um, I think that's a good note to end on, though, John, because the signatories to the Paris Peace Accords committed to certain principles in perpetuity. Uh, and, and so they still have obligations in that regard, and it would be nice for some of them, besides the United States, um, which doesn't show enough interest, but at least shows some interest. It'd be nice for some of the others in Indonesia and France and, and some of the other signatories to also assume some responsibility and begin to mo at least monitor the situation in Cambodia uh, more closely, and, and ultimately, I think, to, uh, to coordinate, uh, coordinate policies. Uh, speaking of which, um, I've plugged all the books here represented, uh, <laughs> Dr. Ears. I plugged, uh, I plugged um, Sitchan's from five years ago, and I even plugged Brett's book. But uh, Olivia, uh, Olivia Anos and I uh, did a report on a, which, with a much shorter shelf life uh, that gets at this issue and, and many others on the current crisis and what U.S. policy can be, and we've got that out front for you if you all want to pick up a copy of it. But uh, with that, let me thank our guests for being here today. Brett Schaefer, my colleague, who, I'm, who I have the honor and, and, um, and uh, uh, use of working with every day, because he's an expert right down the hall. I can talk to you about all these other things. And our guests uh, from afar, not quite Cambodia, but uh, I think Sichan is the biggest Texan I know, but, uh, but he's come from Texas at least, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Ear coming from California. Thank you very much for doing this, and I hope that it's something we can stay focused on. We'll post the uh, We'll post this online. It'll be on our on our website, archived, and we'll ship it out to as many people as we can to continue to keep focus on it. Thank you very much. Thank you.